Hello, we're just getting ready for the uh, Launchpad lecture. Uh, this time we're talking about uh, watches in space. It's my wife's birthday. John Wayne, you know, and you got to walk like this and look at your watch, you know, so it doesn't matter how you wear it, but time is what you read from a watch, at least according to a relatively smart guy named Albert Einstein. We've been using watches in space for forever. Now, you'll notice as well I'm using the term watch, but the actual lecture topic was chronographs in space. We'll get to that in just a second. So, in any case, though, as you can see here in the picture, watch. So, oh, wait, what? No watch. Yeah, actually, it does have a watch on there. But in any case, though, um, 
We're going to talk about omega pretty specifically, but we will mention other watch or chronograph companies as well during the time frame. So the first question is, what's the difference between a watch and a chronograph? Anybody out there know? Usually most people don't. Right. Well, <laughs> one would think so, except for there are watches that are just as expensive as chronographs out there. But there is a difference. No, nope, not quality. A watch is the thing that's keeping time. Okay? A stopwatch is a thing where you kind of push a button and you, you know it measures off seconds kind of thing. A chronograph has both. A chronograph is something where you're going to be able to measure minutes, seconds, things like that, and it's actually going to have other items on it, other dials, or another method of measurement that actually is going to provide that additional information on it. So it's not just a watch that gives you that it's 10, 15, you know, and Mickey's hand is here, you know, whatever. So it doesn't just give you the time, it also gives you a way to measure time as well. And aviators, as we all know, kind of like that, you know, being able to measure, you know, sometimes uh, 15 seconds, you know, etc. And if you think about it, if you're going to be flying in space, yes, you have equipment that is computerized, or sometimes not computerized, analog, whatever, so, but it is actually, say, counting down the burn for an engine. You might want to have a backup, just in case, okay? So that's why it was important, that's why the, uh, the astronauts wanted them, and that's how we end up with our story today. But we're going to go back, we're talking about, like I said, Omega and its story within this whole thing, because it's a key player. It's the key player in all of this. Omega, it didn't start off as the name Omega. Uh, we now know it that it, today, um, that company. You know, if you watch any James Bond movie, you see the James Bond watch and he always wears Omega. Um, uh, you know it probably from the space program, it's been advertised for many years. Etc. But we know Omega today, but it didn't start off that way. Back in 1848, it started off by Louis Bront as La Générale. That was the name of the, of the watch company that, uh, that was originally started up. Started manufacturing watches, actually really kind of took off. Um, we know the Swiss are well known for their capabilities in the watchmaking world, so in that chronograph making world that we're going to get into here. Eventually, in 1879, he dies, and his, he has four children. The oldest is 24. And they take over operating the company. And they do it well, actually. So um, the sons moved the company to BL um, uh, from where it originally started up. And then eventually, they, and they start really improving the watches themselves. They take a look at the manufacturing process. And they're the first ones who actually create a manufacturing process similar to what we think of with Henry Ford, you know, where you have an assembly line going down. They do something similar with the watches and really make it more efficient, but still very high quality. And eventually in 1894, they create a watch that they call the Omega Caliber. That's the caliber of the watch. That's the essentially the internals, shall we say, of the watch. That's the biggie for them. This watch is very highly regarded, purchased, lots of people purchase it, and so eventually they change the name of the company to, guess what, Omega, based on the success of the caliber of this, uh, of this watch at that point in time. 1903, Paul Emil Brandt, Okay, they're kind of coming down through the children eventually, takes over and he runs the company for about 50 years and this is the glory days of Omega when it really takes off, becomes very well known, one of the top two watch companies in, in Switzerland. Anybody know what the other one is? Rolex. Yeah, Rolex, yeah, so obviously it's a very, very popular watch name. Uh, pop, popular if you're, if you have money too, by the way. <laughs> when we're gonna talk about these Omega chronographs, it's the watch that I would desperate, excuse me, it's the chronograph that I would desperately love to own and really, on no way on God's green earth could I afford to buy one, so they are extremely expensive. So, in any case, here's the, when you take a look at the, the caliber, the movement, shall we say, okay? Um, 1946, the Omega 321, this is the 321 uh, movement. This is the key one, because eventually this really is what is the basis for what flies in space. Um, there are others here, the CK2950, this has to do with the face, not the movement on the inside, but the face. You can see when we start talking about chronographs, here's where you have your dials, your buttons that can operate, stopwatch, et cetera, et cetera. That's what sets it apart from a watch as a chronograph, is the capability to be able to do that measurement, start, stop, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so space. How does Omega fit in with space? This guy is the reason. 
the astronauts flew, they flew in space, they wanted to have a watch, you know, go back to that term, a watch with them, they really wanted to have a chronograph, uh, and they, it, it, during the Mercury program, there was no selection process. In fact, a lot of the things in the Mercury program that we utilized were just stuff that NASA grabbed off a shelf somewhere and utilized um, inside the capsule. Um, there wasn't quite as much of the rigorous testing selection process that we think of today for stuff that flies up to the International Space Station or you know in the, in the space shuttle when it was flying or for our new programs, et cetera. At that point in time, it was like, hey, we have a need for X. Well, how can we do that? You know, Well, maybe we'll cobble together this and this and this, send somebody out and buy it. And they just went out into town and bought it. Well, in this situation, NASA wasn't buying the watches for the astronauts. They just took their own. They took their own. In fact, John Glenn had a cure stopwatch that he took with him on his flight. Scott Carpenter had a Breitling watch. And Wally Schirra had an Omega Speedmaster. Speedmaster was the name of one of the, essentially the brands of watches uh, that Omega was creating, or the lines of watches, excuse me, not the brands, because brand is Omega, but the line of watches that they're chronographs. See, I find this difficult as well, so I'm going to slip back and forth, and I, and I apologize for that. Chronographs. But Wally Schirra took one up on his mission with him. Here you can see him. He is wearing, the, the, he's wearing two, two. So he's, he's also got an Accutron watch on as well. And he did utilize um, uh, and have both of them. So he flew with the Omega. Uh, he actually gave the other watch to, anybody know who he gave it to? I'm interested, Gus Grissom. He gave it to Gus Grissom. Gus Grissom had it all the way up through the Apollo 1 fire and actually had it on him when the Apollo 1 fire occurred. Later on, uh, 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 excuse me, um, Gus's wife gave Wally Exact same type of watch because obviously the first one uh, was destroyed in the fire. So, but Wally flies in space. This is just a picture. They were testing out actually the Hasselblad camera, but he just happened to be wearing both watches at the time. So, a man with one watch knows what time it is. A man with two watches is never quite sure. <laughs> Not really true, but in any case, that is just one of those little little things. But this is this is the actual Speedmaster that Wally wore on his flight. Um, right here, a little bit more of a close-up of it. Yeah, sorry, fuzzy. Can't do much about that. So, uh, but so this is the first of the Omegas to fly in space. So, and that happens during his Mercury mission uh, in 1962. So that is the first occasion of an Omega, a Speedmaster, flying in space. But it won't be the last, because as the Mercury program ends and we move into the Gemini program, now NASA, Na you know, NASA kind of was. Was, was jogging along, now they're coming up to a full run. Their bureaucracy is much bigger, their procedures are much bigger, their staff size is much bigger, the requirements being placed on them are much bigger, the program is getting more visibility as they're headed towards eventual moon flights, etc., etc., etc. So now there's a desire amongst both NASA and the astronaut corps to have a standardized chronograph something that they can carry. They want one, they definitely want one, but they want it standardized so that they know that it's going to survive and that they know what the capabilities of it are and everybody's got the same one. So they're not having to worry about, well, how much time does a Bulova lose? How much time does a Rolex lose? How much time does a Breitling lose? How much time, you know, they, they, need to, they need it to be standardized. So they go out, oh, sorry. This is a, by the way, sorry, I forgot that I had one more slide here, so. Um, they did a replica of Wally's watch. Omega's big into doing doing uh, recreations and replicas, um, uh, uh, commemorative watches, etc. So they did one here recently, and this was the commemorative that they did. So in any case, in the Gemini program, by the way, you'll see one right there. They decide to do that. So they decide to do some testing on different chronographs to see what may or may not pass, so that they can select it. What's the best one out there? So they actually kind of start searching out there for the chronographs that are the most highly regarded, and they come down to essentially five competitors. They send out letters, a bunch of folks don't even get back to them, interestingly enough. So, but five do, they decide to go with those five, they end up producing two of each. Now, interestingly enough, I say five, there's some conflict historically as to whether it was actually five that were tested or four, regardless, the Breitling, that's why it's in, uh, um, in uh, italics down there, uh, may or may not have been completely involved with all of the testing. In any case, though, we're going to go with five. 
Rolex, Longines, Hamilton, Omega, Breitling. Hamilton submits a stopwatch in the process. The others all submit chronographs. So um, they purchased the Omegas, at least, they, and they purchased them at Corrigan, which is a shop out in, out in Houston. So um, there's, by the way, there's a rumor control thing that they kind of did it without anybody knowing. They went out and secretly bought the watches. I said, yeah, we're, yeah that's, that's all urban legend. So in any case, though, bought the watches, 82.50, fairly expensive. 1964 is bottom on October 21st, and they developed qualification test procedures. So here you can see the watches being put through the qualification test. The centrifuge facility here, <laughs> an oven, literally an oven, over there in the bottom right. And yes, I am going to tell you, and there's no way I have this memorized. So in any case, what were they put through? Well, high temperature, 48 hours at 160 degrees Fahrenheit, followed by 30 minutes at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Low temperature, four hours at zero. Temperature cycling in near vacuum, 15 cyclings of 160 degrees Fahrenheit for 45 minutes, followed by cooling to zero degrees for 45 minutes. Humidity, 250 hours, and temperatures between 68 and 160, the relative humidity of 95%. Oxygen environment, 100% pure oxygen environment. Shock testing, 40 G shocks. Linear acceleration, uh, low pressure, 90 minutes, and 10 to the minus six tor, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, if you really totally care, essentially. Low pressure vacuum testing if you want to get high pressure testing, <laughs> just in case. Vibration testing, three cycles of 30 minutes. Vibration varying from five to 2,000 hertz with a minimum of 8.8 .8 Gs of impulse. And acoustic noise testing, 130 dB, et cetera, time. Yeah, they put them through a whole lot and they were seeing, were they still accurate? Were they losing time you know, in between each test or during, you know, during the test, et cetera? <laughs> and put them through all of this down there. In the end, operational environmental tests of the three selected chronographs have been completed, and as a result of the test, Omega chronographs have been calibrated and issued to three members of the Gemini Titan III GT3 crews. NASA communique from the 1st of March, 1965, said the astronauts show a unanimous preference for the Omega chronograph over the other two brands. Two brands did kind of come down. One had been eliminated, by the way, remember stopwatch? Hey. Uh, because of better accuracy, reliability, readability, ease of operation. <laughs> Bottom line being is that the only watch that passed was the Omega. The others all failed at some point in time. They broke, they stopped operating, um, in different tests, etc., etc., etc. Omega passed, so Omega gets chosen as the chronograph, and they buy watches for all of the astronauts, and in addition, they create these Velcro straps. Because they're not, you know, they are wearing them on their wrists. But they're really got them for when they're in the spacesuits. Um, and so they use them both ways. You know, the strap is adjustable so it can be worn on the wrist or around the outside of the spacesuit on the arm kind of thing. So, and Omega goes flying. Very famously, here we go. Who is this? Ed White. Ed White on the first spacewalk, and you can see his Omega chronograph right there. So, and oh, by the way, we really have no problem with the Omega chronographs throughout the space program on any of the missions, um, with one notable exception during the Apollo program, which will come up, but it wasn't really a problem with the Omega. So, but something happened, and I'll get to that. So, here it is, you know, uh, once again, <laughs> with all of the engraving, yada, yada, yada. So this is actually a, a purchase one from 1968, so we're, we're into the Apollo program at this point in time. But just showing, I mean, just the paperwork for purchasing it, and, you know, receiving it, engraving it, yada, 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 yada. So, and all these watches, by the way, that flew to the moon, Eventually, are anybody know where they all are? Take a wild guess, Smithsonian. So Smithsonian owns all. Of them. They're not all on display at the Smithsonian, but the, but that's that's who owns all of them. And we're working on getting one, by the way. So, so we're working on getting one to put on display here. When we put it on display, we'll also try and be we'll also be working with the Omega Company to get an Omega display here with the giant watch on the wall and, and stuff around it, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in any case, so because Omega lays this up, as you'll. See as we go through all of this. Um, in any case, this is the watch that eventually is utilized in the, the Gemini program and the Apollo program, and in the Skylab. And essentially, really, when we get into the shuttle program, we'll kind of get into that too. But this is the Omega Speedmaster. It didn't, it did, and, and you see the word professional on there. After this thing is flying for, for about a year and a half with space, they add the term professional in there. So. Because it's not just a speedmaster, it's a speedmaster. It flies in space. 
And yeah, they did put advertising out on it, et cetera. So eventually it gets utilized on the moon. So um, and it gets, gets utilized on all the lunar flights. Um, so who's wearing the first watch that ends up on the moon? Easy question. Okay, no, not Neil. Buzz. Even though Buzz got out second. So why is that? What happened to Neil? Did he not get a watch? Did NASA forget to give Neil Armstrong a watch? A chronograph? <laughs> that must have been a significant oversight. Nope, not it at all. When they landed on the moon, they were having problems with one of the countdown timers inside the spacecraft. And they, the, guess what was, remember that whole backup thing? Okay, so what's the backup? For the timer inside the spacecraft? It's your chronograph. Okay, so if you both get out there on the lunar surface, which by the way, neither of them had ever done before. In fact, nobody had ever done it before. Um, so we hadn't walked on the lunar surface, so we really didn't know what might or might not happen, and would it get, you know, might you break it or whatever else if you're out there working? What if both of them got broken? Now you got no backup. So they decided to leave one of them inside the spacecraft. Neil's, they just hung right up there uh, on the control panel inside the lunar module. Buzz wore his out, so Buzz has the honor of having worn the first, the first uh, uh, chronograph to actually be utilized on the lunar surface. So, and here he is with, you can see once again, here's his chronograph, and Omega, yeah, uses this picture all the time. So, mm -hmm. there's not a good picture of Neil Armstrong even inside the spacecraft with the chronograph on. Um, I mean, there are pictures of him with it on, but not one that just kind of screams, you know, look at <laughs> bling bling here, you know, so, okay, so in any case, and Buzz and a lot of the astronauts still work with Omega today um, on uh, uh, marketing campaigns, et cetera, et cetera, so uh, Omega would be stupid not to keep them on board, so Cernan does a ton of stuff with them, Buzz Aldrin, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so Apollo 11 finishes up, Omega wants to commemorate the fact that they were the first you know, first they and they use the term first watch on the moon. Okay, they use the term, not me, them. So first watch on the moon. So and in fact, actually, they advertised themselves for many, many years as the first and only watch on the moon. That'll come into play here in a second. So while Apollo 12 is actually flying to the moon on November 25th, 1969, they have a black tie event at the Warwick Hotel in Houston, and they issue to all of the astronauts who had flown to that point in time a 18 karat gold Omega Speedmaster. They give, they give them that. These aren't from NASA. These are commemoratives given and authorized, NASA said, NASA said fine, given to the astronauts who flew. So, and they are inscribed on the back to mark man's conquest of space with time, through time, on time. And it has the name of the astronaut here and then the missions that they flew. This is Wally Shiraz. Wally's is quite is, is the only one that was inscribed with Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo missions because he was the only guy who flew on all three. Um, three of our first programs that got to the moon. They were issued in these boxes um, that had kind of the image of a lunar surface on the outside. By the way, if you're ever in an antique store and you ever see one of these boxes, buy it. Even if it doesn't have a watch in it, buy the box. Because people, they also did a series, there was, there was over a thousand of these made. The first bunch were obviously the ones issued to the astronauts, the rest were sold. Gee, what a surprise. So they sold them and people bought them like crazy. And they are still out there, they are highly coveted. But what's missing with most every single one of them? The box. And so if you ever see one, buy it. You can sell that for quite a bit of money to a person who owns one of these, um, uh, these uh, commemorative watches. In any case, the interesting thing about the box is, is that there was not a big gigantic, you don't see a big gigantic Omega on the side of it. And even when they were making the presentations, they weren't allowed to say Omega such and such. It was a Swiss made chronograph. That was just kind of the government rules about what they could and couldn't say if they were presenting them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, just kind of one of those interesting commemoratives that, uh, that Omega did um, as it was going along. Here we got another picture from Apollo 12 that occurs just very soon afterwards. You can see another chronograph there on a wrist. Uh, eventually, you know, we get to Apollo 14. Here they are taking their, their pictures ahead of time, and all three of them had their Omega chronographs on their, on their arm. Okay. Watches are so named as a reminder. If you don't watch carefully what you do with your time, it will slip away from you. 
another good reason to have a watch on the surface of the moon. You need something to mark the time, the mission time, even though you've got somebody talking in your ear constantly. Okay? Even though mission control is letting you know how much time has been going on on that EVA, whether you want them to stop or not, they're constantly <coughs> talking to you. So, but we as humans, we as people, we've gotten used to it. We still want to do this, whichever way you do it, all the time to see exactly what time it is, how much time has elapsed, et cetera, et cetera. So it helps us. In any case, ah, now we get a little bit into the, did anything else fly? Was anything else used? Well, first of all, yeah, other stuff did fly. In fact, actually, the full of, uh, remember those Accutron? They were actually extremely good timepieces, very accurate. NASA used those inside the spacecraft, actually for the timers inside the spacecraft. So yeah, Bulova, we'll talk about that one, was already flying, but it was actually being flown with a piece of, with a, with a countdown timer that was inside the equipment on the spacecraft in and of itself. But when Apollo 13 goes up, this individual here, um, I'm not sure if anybody can read it, but who knows who that is? Just by looking at the face. Yeah, it's swigert. Yep, so. Doesn't look like Lovell. That's the, kind of the easy thing. So you got kind of two people left. It's either Fred Hayes or Jack Swigert. This is Jack Swigert, who wasn't on the prime crew. He was on the backup crew, but immediately before the mission, Ken Mattingly is exposed to measles. NASA decides not to fly him just so that he wouldn't potentially develop measles during the flight. And so the backup um, command module pilot gets shunted up to the prime crew and flies with Apollo 13. So um, he goes up. He's got a Rolex. GMT watch um, that he carries with him. And he actually had both, two watches. Once again, not uncommon necessarily so, but we know for certain that he flew with his Rolex GMT, excuse me, uh, on him, even though you see an Omega Speedmaster on his wrist right here, they wore that. That was the official timepiece. Yeah, he would have gotten in a lot of trouble if you'd seen a Rolex GMT strapped to his space suit. But underneath, he had the Rolex. Um, on his wrist as, as a backup for himself because that's what he liked. Uh, in any case, there's a little, there, there's, there's, there's kind of a controversy over which timepiece was actually utilized. When they had to do the burn, coming on their way back from the moon to the earth, they had to do a burn, and remember, everything was pretty much shut down. So timing-wise, they had to time it with, guess what, that backup, a chronograph. Either Jim Lovell's Speedmaster or the Rolex GMT was used, and there's argument over, you know, and it's, it's, you know, he died. So the official answer is not, not out there. So, um, but it probably is likely that he used the Rolex GMT to actually time that maneuver um, for the burn on the engine that they had to burn for 14 seconds um, on, on their way back. So, yes, other watches, chronographs, shall we say. Um, did fly in space, were utilized in space, uh, and now you can kind of see there's the, the astronaut preferences kind of come in here a little bit. Universally, they most of them preferred the, uh, the Omega Speedmaster, but there were some, some things out there. And you can definitely see, even here, where he takes a picture, Rolex. Here, when they're back on Earth, right after the mission, Rolex, right there. In fact, zoomed in a little bit so you can see it in case you're curious. So, yeah, he's still got the two watches on. So. So and there's what the actual the actual watch looks like. Okay, so there's our first instance of where we know for certain that another watch brand flew um, uh, and was utilized uh, within a mission. Omega um, is obviously um, officially quote unquote used during the mission. Officially used for these timing you know uh, incidents etc. Uh, and they are actually given a, a special Snoopy Award by NASA. And if you have referred to the, to the lecture that we did a while back, we talked about Snoopy Awards um, uh, quite a while back at one of these things. And that is the way that NASA awards employees and folks like that who have made significant contributions to the successful completion of a space mission or maintaining and helping out or contributing to the safety of the astronauts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those little silver, they're little tiny, little tiny silver Snoopy, um, shaped pins are highly coveted within the NASA community. So it's like getting the Congressional Medal of Honor. You know, so forget the Distinguished Service Medal, forget all this other stuff, you want a silver Snoopy. So, and because they're presented off also by an astronaut to the individual, they are flown in space on the missions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Omega was presented with a silver Snoopy 
um, by uh, by the crew and by NASA afterwards. Uh, that is still displayed in their museum, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so um, they transitioned during this time frame. The, I said that caliber 321. They transitioned to a caliber 861 um, during the uh, um, uh, uh, excuse me uh, during the lunar program. There's the back of that one, just kind of showing you. It's based on the 321, though, just in case you're curious. Okay, now. Before Apollo 17 flies, <coughs> there is a significant push by the Bulova watch company to do the requalifications again, because they want a Bulova to fly. It's an American company, and so by, by American Act, it, at least 51% of it has to be made in America. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen for an Omega chronograph made in Switzerland. So. So in any case, the Boulevard company really starts pushing this one. And so in August 1972, um, NASA goes back out. It's a big memo, out to 16 companies out there. And it's looking for you know, an American, American watch to come in to be tested. And, but they're going to test all of them again. And so there's not just American companies here. There's also Swiss companies in here you start to go, OK. You know, that 51% thing isn't a mandatory. That's a, that's a qualifier, though. You know that will eliminate out some, not just not because they're not maybe fifty percent, because other issues and the fifty-one percent thing. So they go and they do the testing all over again. Um, in in the end, the key thing being is is that the bulletin fails during the testing. It fails in a couple of areas. They fail in the humidity um, every time. So and during the acceleration testing. The Omega passes again, but both, you know, both of us still say 51%, 51%. So two things are very interesting about that. One, Omega got past that by, man, I'm not even gonna read it, basically taking a number of the components of the watch, bringing them to the United States, having them assembled, put together here in the United States. So they util and they utilize then other pieces manufactured in the United States by watch companies here. Hamilton Watch Company specifically, so that it would be so that it would pass that 51% test, but it's still the same chronograph. Bulova, who's been saying American made, American made, American made, is where the chronographs came from. Switzerland. They bought them through a subsidiary and sold them off, quote unquote, as American made watches. <laughs> yeah. And in any case, then they took a couple of components out of it, a couple of pieces out of it, put them back in. And in the end, it still wasn't enough to pass the 51% test. So then they said that the $23,000 of research and development that they put into it to help it pass, that counted and that pushed it up over the 51%. The whole thing was shady to me. But that's not the end of it. Bulova still, even after this, really wants to get a watch to fly. And so through contacts, they're working with, they, they get in touch with Dave Scott, and they convince Dave Scott, the commander of Apollo 15, to fly with the Boulevard. This is all going on at the same time, just in case you're curious. And so Dave Scott does. He flies with both the Boulevard. You know, you already saw with Jack Schweiger. He flew with a Speedmaster and a Boulevard. So, they, um, yeah, Jack Schweiger. Dave Scott flies with a Boulevard and a Speedmaster. And he gets up there and flies, lands on the lunar surface, <coughs> excuse me, um, and in the front, they have three EVAs. He's wearing a the Speedmaster. Um, famously, though, during the second EVA, the watch face gets broken. So for the third EVA, he whips out the Bulova and wears the Bulova for the third EVA. So you're seeing it. So in any case, this is the Bulova that he wore um, uh, up on the surface of the moon. So. On the lunar surface, this is why Omega can't say the only watch <laughs> to be used on the lunar surface. That's why they stood, they marketed today as the first watch. NASA didn't let folks because of what happened after Apollo 15, with the with the, the controversy over the signed insurance covers, the things that were that were um, uh, kind of private gain for the astronauts. There was lots of controversy with that, congressional hearings and everything else. This was kept relatively quiet. As far as the, the whole bull of the thing um, uh, going up there, not necessarily a big deal. Just flew with two watches, but NASA didn't want there to be any controversy 
with what with everything else that was going on. Now, this bullet book, by the way, was just went up for auction because it was Dave's private watch. The Speedmasters were NASA property. They were issued to the astronauts. They were given back, and um, then now they're in the National Air Space Museum's collection. But the bullet book was was Dave Scott's watch, so he had it in private, had it in his possession. He sold it at auction recently. Anybody know how much it went for? Yeah, <laughs> too much is probably the right answer. So unless you happen to have another chronograph that was actually utilized um, in the space program, and then you're sort of like, oh my gosh, like a lot of money now. So in any case, though, um, that, anybody got a guess? <laughs> More. Wow. 1.3 million. More. 1.6 million dollars. Or a watch. So, in any case, now mind you, it was a watch used on the lunar surface. It shows all the wear and tear of a watch chronograph, but watch used on the lunar surface. By the way, that band is infused with lunar dust and material and everything. So, is that a mechanical watch? Yeah. Yep, they were wine, wine watches. So. In, yep, which were, which were like, so. In any case, um, the other thing that flew on this mission, sorry, oh, by the way, yeah, so you can see them in, there's the watch right there. So that's during the recovery for half of the mission. This flew as well. Okay, stopwatch. And they, they did utilize this during the mission. Dave Scott, once again, took his personal Bulova timer up there with him. And this was what he had as a backup. He didn't like the fact that the Speedmasters and even the chronograph were down to one-fifth of a second. He wanted it down to one-tenth of a second. So he took this with him uh, to utilize up there in space. And so when they were doing the lunar orbit insertion uh, maneuvers to put them into their final orbits, um, they needed to guess what? Guess how much time the burn was? 24 seconds. So was the burn. And so you had the timer inside the spacecraft that was counting it down. Once again, who's the timer made by? Bulova, okay, just as a note, okay, so, but they were out there with the stopwatch and the minute that the engine started, they started that because they, that was, that's a word that you don't want to go wrong, you know, so in any case, and so they watched it and they just were making sure that the automatic system cut out exactly when it was supposed to, but they were there on the button just in case it didn't shut off, they were ready to kill it at the same time by utilizing this as a timer. So, and this this stopwatch is in a private collection. So, there you go. That's a piece of duct tape that marked 24 seconds. 24 seconds is right here. So if as the as the watch head came out, you know, the minute it came out, you would kill it. So, okay. Now, eventually on Apollo 17, they're flying, and you can see they're even using chronographs. You know, this was this was for uh, one of the experiments on board. They okay, mounted the chronograph right there uh, on the experiment during Apollo 17. NASA, as I said, utilized it in advertising um, uh, all throughout the Gemini and the uh, the Apollo program. Just going to show you some of the marketing. Yeah, this was yeah. <laughs> for a while, so, and then eventually they had to remove that and say the first watch. So everything you see now says the first watch. What's the time frame of this head? This one? I can't remember. So, I think I've done some of the back early 2000s. Yep, so, now, here you go. Flight qualified by NASA for all manned space missions. It was the only one flight qualified for all the manned missions and the first watch worn on the moon. Not the only watch. But the first, so, the moon watch. Here's where. Here's another one where it still said, the first and only watch worn on the moon. Okay, as you are still in the Apollo program, but have moved past the lunar landings, you get into the um, Skylab missions. They're still utilized during the Skylab missions. You get into the Apollo Soyuz test project. Now you have an interesting addition to this one as well. You've also got the cosmonauts. We're flying up and we're going to combine. Uh, Omega sees an opportunity here. So what does Omega do? Take a wild guess. What's that? Okay, started working with the Russian Space Agency now. So, and 
uh, the Russians specialized watches as well. So, and no, he wasn't doing this on purpose to show his watch, which is the way the photograph um, was taken. But you can see Leonov up there in the upper right. Alexei Leonov, he's got a Speedmaster on, uh, or he's got a, a uh, Omega chronograph. They actually chose a slightly different watch. Um, the Russians did. So in any case, though, and then Stafford's got, uh, um, got his chronograph on as well. Now, as we move forward into the shuttle program here in the middle to late 1970s, full of us, yeah. back again. They're back. <clears throat> OK, so the shuttle missions are going to be imminent. Well, we think they're going to be closer than they actually are with complications of designing and building the spacecraft. But they start to want to requalify, recheck out new opportunities. You know, once again, you had wind-up watches before. Now you might want to have automatic watches or chronographs. I still slip back into that. So, so they decided to go out and do a whole series of tests again. Once again, bring in all of the competitors. Test all of the competitors' chronographs. They do eight tests. I can read them to you if you want, or you can come up and take a look at them afterwards. It's the same types of tests. Okay, full of them. Fails the salt fog and vacuum tests. Again, Omega submits three different chronographs, and they all pass. It's essentially the same movement as was utilized during the Apollo program. So it's the same movement, slightly updated, kind of new face sort of thing, um, but it's based on that original. So it's essentially the exactly the exact same watch, and Omega sells them to the uh, lunar program for one cent each. So for the amount of marketing they're getting out of all of this, <laughs> oh yeah, good idea. So, and they sell 56 watches. So um, here, yep. Yeah, so he, he actually he's got two. He's got a watch and a chronograph on. So just showing you pictures of folks. You know. Russian space suit, that's an oral on space suit in case you're looking at it going, why the hell is it that color? That's a Russian EVA um, space suit, not a US one. And eventually we move into the digital age. So Omega creates a new chronograph that gets utilized not in the early days of the space shuttle program, but in the later days of the space shuttle program, the X33 here with the digital face that you've got on as well. But it still has you know, the regular time analog time uh, on the front of it as well. So, but the actual measuring is done with the, with the digital uh, function. Here you can see it utilized on the International Space Station, on the Russian spaces, EVA spaces, so, and by our intrepid astronaut there. By the way, still, these are issued to the astronauts. They're not given to the astronauts. They're issued to the astronauts now. The astronauts can buy them if they want to. But they have to pay the full price of what an equipment watch would cost. Not what the government cost, got it for, but what it would cost on the open market. So, but they can buy their buy their chronograph if they want to. Some of them have done it. So, here you go, getting getting it put on. So I always like to show a picture of Steve Bowen and so one of my best friends. So. <laughs> okay, commemoratives. Omega to this day is still producing tons of commemoratives where you've got here. The, uh, the Apollo Soyuz commemorative, where they did 1,975 of the chronographs. And oh, by the way, you think, wow, that's a lot. You know, 1,975 of these very expensive chronographs. You know, you're talking about a, wa a, a, a watch essentially costing anywhere from a few thousand dollars to fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. You know, that you're putting on, depending on the, the you know, what it is. <laughs> they sell fast, really fast, and you have to buy them from the boutiques, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's the back. Yeah, that's the back with the engraving. Sorry, I guess I should have said that. <laughs> so, okay, on the front side here, you know, specialized, you know, chronographs. This was a commemorative created. It's got the red face on it. So, so here's one for the commemorate that was done in 2009 to commemorate the Apollo landing. Yeah. Is that box texture or is that? That is texture. That's a recreation. This was. This is actually one of my favorites that they've ever done. That's the watch face, uh, face of the Speedmaster Professional. It's got the same movement that was utilized on the lunar missions, but you'll notice the face looks really different. Anybody got any idea what that is? Why it looks different? What's it? No. Whoa, that would be. Woo! I cannot imagine what that would cost <laughs> if they could get a hold of the moon dust and put that on in there. So that would probably be. You know, we talk about that 1.6 million dollar watch just shoot way beyond that. Yeah, sure, sure. 
No. No. It's a meteorite. Oh. It's a meteorite face. So every single one of these that they produce is different. So, because they're slivers. They're slivers of meteorite that are then put onto the face of the watch. They're absolutely beautiful. It was the only time that I was ever tempted to pay as much for a watch as you would for a car. So, oh, when they first came out, um, I want to say it was 8,500 or 9,000. So it was it was up there. In any case, Omega's got you know in in a, in a small bit of their museum, you know, got the whole yeah. I love the lunar rover with Omega. All <laughs> over. It's like it's a race car. <laughs> so. so the replica space suit, the lunar landing leg, watches. Um, some of these are ones that are on loan from the Smithsonian. Um, say again? Yeah. Yep. Sorry. Um, you'll see displays. The local boutiques will even do displays where they will get in touch with local collectors, etc., and do it. So um, this is that's the actual Snoopy pin. Remember, I mentioned that. And there, this was a display that was done in Boston, um, uh, uh, Omega. Uh, boutique, so where they got a hold of uh, some of the, the chronographs, etc., from private collectors and from on loan from uh, the company Slack and also from the uh, museum. Okay, so that kind of is the history of, you know, and why we say Omega um, when we talk about the chronographs in space. So uh, I'll get to my questions thing here in just a moment, but I'm going to finish up by saying that. We got something old, something new, something we're getting, and it isn't blue here at the museum. We're getting one of these. This is the new spacesuit that NASA is going to be using for EVA. For, for essentially, when they go on these Mars missions, or asteroid missions, or deep space missions, whatever they are, they're going to use this suit, the V2, um, or X2, excuse me. Uh, suit and this is uh, the actual one that is in the NASA suit lab. Um, we, along with four of the NASA centers, have uh, got our, our, have ordered one, and so they're not cheap, by the way. So, um, and it should be here within the next few weeks, kind of thing. They're actually just kind of finalizing it up and putting the patches on for us. And it was interesting because NASA went back and forth over a three-week period between gray patches or color patches. And so our suit was has been delayed by three weeks as NASA went back and forth <laughs> over the color of the patches onto it. So it's been kind of funny. As you can see in the end, they've gone with color. So uh, in any case, though, um, but the, and the other thing that's changing is that uh, instead of the clear, it's going to go with a silver um, a helmet on uh, the front. So that, you know, that's, that's the final look that it will have uh, when it shows up here. And these will be wearable suits. Um, so we will be able to put it on display, or we will be able to wear it. Like we also have a uh, Apollo A7L suit that is displayable or wearable, and we have a um, shuttle Aces spacesuit that is displayable or wearable. But they are exact replicas of the originals. Replicas matter to us because if you try and get an original of, well, first of all, these are. I mean, NASA is. I mean, this this is the first one off the line. You know, from NASA, kind of thing. So we're getting it at the same time that NASA is. Um, the A7L suit, the Apollo suit. For you to get an A7L suit, you have to build a case for it that is nitrogen encased, refrigerated. You know, yada yada yada. It is a fortune to build the enclosure for that one. And the Air and Space Museum right now isn't even loaning them out, so it's impossible to get one. So a replica is so much easier because you don't have all of those controls. And then it has the added benefit. That if we want to utilize it for marketing, shall we say? So to wear it out at White Sands to build a commercial, we're going to do that. So and we have done that. So with, with our spacesuit, so we can utilize this one. In fact, actually, if we want to, film companies could rent this from us. So income coming in. So that's not the only change coming down the pipe. Yes. No. Can I take it to Comic Con? What's it? Can you take it to Comic Con? Where? You can think about it. All right. <laughs> Not likely because the upper torso is hard on this one. It would be much harder for you to actually transport. You uh, want to come with me to Comic Con? We actually no, have him wear an A7L Apollo spacesuit at Comic Con in San Diego. So, <laughs> and that stuff about us so, um, a couple years ago. So, in any case, though, uh, our planetarium slash theater building is shut down right now. In fact, actually, if you notice in the back corner here, we've got a portable planetarium set up 
It's all, you know, it's all taken down right at the moment, but it's back there. That's what we utilize during the day right now. We kind of inflate it right behind where you all are sitting, and that's where we're doing planetarium shows right now because our planetarium is closed, has been since the middle of May, and we will reopen on July 1st um, after they, and the folks are coming here on Tuesday next week to start the three week install to put in the, new, the Spitz 4K laser projection system. We will be the first 4K laser planetarium in the world. So um, uh, that is the first one coming off the line anywhere, and we're gonna install it here, and that's just phase one. So we'll have phase one, we'll open back up, and we'll utilize that for planetarium shows and for our movies. That projector system can do both. So the IMAX system is going away. We'll utilize this new laser projection system. And then in the winter, we will go to phase two, which is we're gonna rip out the dome in its entirety and put in a new dome system as well that is nano scene. You'll no longer see the seams in the dome. So, and that is, Spitz is the only producer of that uh, as well. So, so that will be kind of a, a neat thing for us um, to, to have here. So keep your eyes open for that. Um, if you're not already members, definitely become members so that you can get the invite to the, to the special opening um, uh, that we'll be doing. And also we're gonna be adding a, mem uh, uh, a benefit for members that'll be whenever we bring in a new movie and we're bringing in Journey to Space here first, um, which is a new uh, movie from Giant Screen Films. Uh, when we bring in a new movie though, we'll do a free screening weekend for members. So. In any case, that takes me to questions that you may have about anything. Were the astronauts able to use the stopwatch function on their monograph with the gloves on the outside? No, they were not. So when they were able to use it and did use it inside the spacecraft inside, yeah. for many things. They always used it as a backup when they were doing engine burns. Always, always, always. Um, but yes, when they were in spacesuit, uh, walk doing an EVA or a lunar EVA, a space, you know, a moonwalk, there was no way to push the buttons. It was just a timepiece on their wrists so that they could see how much time had elapsed uh, while they were doing the actual moonwalk. So, yes. Uh, did test pilots start to do wristwatch thing? Or was that a no, definitely not an astronaut thing. So, I I, that, yeah. from test so that started that started with yeah, it wasn't just test pilots, that was pilots. pilots. Really kind of started that. But that the tradition of multiple time pieces goes back even further. That. that goes back into the maritime days. So where you had where you, you had two comparative time pieces. So you didn't so. you never knew what time it really was. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. Or hopefully you had a little bit better accuracy yeah. with this one. Yeah. So. I'm not sure, yeah, so, yeah. It's, wondered, it's the 816 movement, that might have just been an error in the slide. In the slide. So, yeah, so, yeah, so, Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'm sorry, uh, the Soviets, before yes. the 75, they were using their own time pieces, I assume. Were they even concerned about that finely tuned time measurement? They, the, okay. yes, um, their onboard equipment, you know, they, the, the stuff that they have always been using, although made in the Soviet Union, still, you know, was highly accurate. So, well, I was just um, wondering, you know, about the whole after Apollo Soyuz, did, was that the only time they used a non Soviet Soviet time? I, you know, I can't say for certain if any of the cosmonauts wore utilized other chronographs 
than the homemade ones prior to that. I'm not sure. I, I don't know the answer to that one, so I'll take that as a little so I don't want to spew forth information that I really don't know. Yeah? So why do you practice that? Uh, just well, you know, actually, don't even remember, and I don't think he, they ever even said it was just as he was as he was doing the EV, during the EVA at some point, it got hit on something. What a surprise! Yeah. You know, think think about how you know you've seen the video probably of them doing these lunar walks. You know, it's amazing it didn't happen more frequently. So, um, but that was the only time that one of the chronographs got broken. Um, on the lunar surface, so, and it's just a good thing that he did happen to have that. It's, it's not like he, he went there and said, I'm going to wear the Bulova on the lunar surface. He was still wearing the Speedmaster, even though Bulova had convinced him to take it on board. So, um, But when that chronograph got broken, you know, <laughs> now that music, work? the chronograph? Yeah, right. As far as I know, it was. So, But, it, you know, once again, at that point in time, you can't consider it accurate because you don't know. So, I'm assuming it hasn't been done since this one. The broken one? I don't know. I am, I am not sure to tell you the truth. So. So. But I know who to ask. I know who to ask. So, Anybody else got any questions? Well, they used this for, they had a lot of marketing on this, but there was a lot of other items that they were used in marketing in space. Were there a lot of other products and things? Well, yeah. 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 Even, even to this day, um, there are two things. And NASA utilizes this as much as the companies do, you know. So um, as as kind of a joint effort, you know. So there's there's things that NASA does that it will create engineering advances, science advances, and things like that. And then they do a, have a program called Spinoff, where those you know companies can come in and utilize those patents, you know, if they have a specific product, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and spin-off technology is very big for NASA. They promote it like crazy, um, and they're, they, they want companies to come in and utilize their advances. Now, you also then have companies of where you know, things get utilized, whether it's a coffee machine on the International Space Station, because Christoph Reddy you know, is flying up there, and she's got to have her espresso you know, kind of thing. So um, you, you, know, you end up with that company working with NASA and the European Space Agency and coming up with the technology, et cetera, and both benefit from that, and they both play it up. You know, the, the, the space program plays up the, you know, working alongside with industry, and the industry works alongside with NASA and then promotes their product. Um, and, you know, and then you have products that just get utilized. <coughs> it can be just about, you know, Velcro. Not created for the space program, but utilized in the space program, and both benefit, you know, you know, from the, from the usage of So you have stuff like that going on all the time. And there's, if you, if you want to, get onto Amazon and buy the book called Marketing the Moon. So Marketing the Moon, uh, written by David Norman Scott and uh, Rich Jurek. Um, fantastic book about what we're exactly talking about here and how NASA and industry work so closely together to really promote each other so that NASA continues moving forward and the companies just kind of went right along with it. You know, so, but great book, really good book. It's a coffee table size book, but it's filled with meat, it's not pictures. So. Yeah, sorry. Uh, early in the program when they were testing these watches, they sent a uh, weightless satellite. Nope, 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 they didn't. Uh, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, as far as they, they were testing all the equipment, you know, so so when you talk about chronographs getting tested in space, yeah, that was happening because you had timers on all the spacecraft. So it was happening. Um, but they didn't specifically take the Omega watches that they had purchased or whatever and send them up on a flight to see how they'd done. They didn't do that as part of that testing. Now, there was testing of chronographs, period, yes, during the early days of the space program. So I'm not saying that that didn't occur, that did. But as far as the Omega testing or the Breitling, you know, the, the Rolex, et cetera, et cetera, when they did that testing, the qualification testing for the for the wrist chronographs, they didn't do anything at that point in time. So. When I was designing spacecraft instruments, the toughest test we had to go through was what was called the thermal back vibration test. Did they ever take a watch that 
yeah, the, that was all the all the stuff that you heard it was talking about. Time. All yeah, thermal yeah, some of it was. Some of the, the thermal and vacuum they did together. I don't think they did the vibration at the same time. I know they did the thermal and the vacuum together. So it was cold and heat in a vacuum uh, where it was subjected to both one extreme for long periods of time and the other extreme for long periods of time, and then alternating for periods of time in a vacuum and just in normal atmosphere, but they didn't do vibration testing at the same time that that was going on. So, yeah. yeah. Does the military use Omega? Um, not that I know of. So, uh, let's be, yeah. Not, not, that, not that I know of. I've never heard about, you know, issues. They use American timepieces to control. Use whatever the pilots want to wear. Well, I was thinking more about military launch and stuff. Um, I don't know. I'll just, I'll just have to say I don't know. I never, I never saw anything about timing, you know, on there. So, and they must not have made good enough chronographs to do it. So. Okay, no, it's uh, ten o'clock. Thanks. Oh, sorry, Sharon. You talk about marketing. Will we ever know what golf club was used on? Yeah. No, we actually won't. So, Sharon, yeah, she, you know, she was. When Alan Shepard um, uh, got up there and uh, actually, no, I take that back. Yeah, we know what kind of golf club. Did you say club or ball? It's club. Club. It was Wilson. Oh, okay. We don't Wilson. Know. In case you're six iron. Or, uh, okay. It was Wilson six iron. Okay. What we don't know ball. is what kind of ball was utilized on the moon by Alan Shepard. He took up two of them. Remember that? So if he dropped the first one and we swung at it, he hit the dirt next. I mean. Try swinging, you know, you're not, you're not like this up on the moon, lining up your shot, you know, and kind of going like this. He's holding the club, which actually was just a okay. club head <laughs> attached to the end of the lunar sailing tool. So he's holding it like this, and he goes like this to hit it. Yeah, okay, you know, in a big old bulky pressurized space suit. So, and missed it slightly, and it just kind of dribbled off to the side. So luckily he brought another ball, he brought another ball with him, he brought it out, dropped it down, and then hit it, and that's the one that went over into the, into the crater kind of thing. But Alan Shepard would never say to anybody what kind of ball it was. And I have talked to his daughter, so, um, specifically, so about that question, because we had, at the museum I used to be at, the PGA Museum, who owned that club, had shut down for a renovation. And so we brought the club to the Cosmosphere, where I was before this, uh, in Kansas. And we had it on display, along with a putter that was utilized uh, in the shuttle program, interestingly enough. Um, so we had both of those on display. And I asked the folks from the PGA Museum, I asked his daughter, I asked a whole bunch of folks, and they all, you know, and everybody, nobody knows what it was. And she said her daddy wouldn't say ever to anybody what kind of ball it was, because he didn't want it to, to kind of blow up as a marketing kind of thing. So the club he had to, because he had to bring the tool back. So <laughs> the ball was staying on the lunar surface. Okay, thank you very much.